Hey everyone, it's Jose here, and welcome to the course overview lecture. I'm super excited that you're starting your journey to learn Python. I know it's sometimes tempting to just skip these intro lectures and go straight to the technical material, but I have one favor to ask of you as you go through this course, and that is to please don't skip this lecture. We're going to cover a lot of important material in this lecture, such as where to find the notebooks, how to approach the course, how to ask questions. So please watch this entire lecture. That way you can get the best course taking experience possible. All right, let's not waste any more of your time and let's get started. In this lecture, we're gonna talk about useful tips for going through the course, how to get help during the course, general advice on how to approach the course, where to find the course notebooks, and how to use the student chat channel. So some general tips as far as your course taking experience. When you're using the video player, you can use the gear setting to either speed up or slow down videos. So if you're like me and you like watching videos a little faster, maybe on 2x speed, you can use the gear setting for that. Or maybe English isn't your first language, you can slow down the videos and you can also do things like turn on closed captions or you can also change the streaming quality. You can use the Udemy app to download videos of the course lectures. And for more information on the Udemy app, you can check out the Udemy support pages for it. Also, make sure to use the Q&A forums there's lots of previous discussion available there to help answer any questions you may have. Let's talk about getting help in a little more detail. Let's talk about the best series of steps to take when you have a question that arises while you're taking the course. If you're coding along with the videos, it's sometimes really easy to make a typo, which is why we provide course notebooks of explanatory text and the Python code for every single lecture. So if you ever get an error due to code that you thought you were following along with in the video, you should double check your code against our course notebooks. You can always just download the notebooks directly and run the notebooks or copy and paste from the notebooks themselves. That way you can make sure that your error isn't due to some typo while you're watching the video. Now, not every single question is going to be directly related to following along with our code. And if you do have a question, sometimes a quick Google search or a Stack Overflow search will get you the answer faster than anyone else could. So I would always recommend doing a Google search or Stack Overflow search, especially if you actually end up getting an error code in Python with maybe some of your own code that you were trying out. Just copy and paste that error code into Google, and a lot of times the very first hit is going to answer your question. Now let's say that still doesn't help you. What you should do is search our Q&A forums in the course. We've had over a quarter of a million students go through this course, so you can almost imagine that any question possible has already been asked and answered by either myself or our teaching assistants. So you should definitely search the Q&A forums before posting there. Now let's say you have a question on just general course things like how to get a certification or where the Udemy app is. Those kind of things are answered in our FAQ lecture. So we have an article lecture with frequently asked questions that you can check out for useful links and more information. Let's say you did all those steps and you're still confused on something. That's absolutely no problem. We're here to help you. The way to do that is to submit a new question to the QA forums and make sure you provide details on what you've tried, screenshots of your error code, and really as much detail as possible. That way we can help you as quickly as possible. Now let's say you have some sort of platform level issue. For those kind of things, you should email support at udemy.com or go to the Udemy support page and open a new issue there. So platform level issues are things like having video playback issues, questions or issues with your certification or questions or issues with payments. Those are platform level issues and we can't really help you out. So email support at udemy.com to quickly get help on that. Finally, let's talk about how to approach the course. The best way to approach the course is to really review the notebooks along with the video. The videos are really great, but we want you to leverage the power of the notebooks we have for you. And both beginners and experienced users can really use the notebooks to best suit them. For beginners, I would recommend that you read the extra notes in the notebook as you go along with the video guide. If you're more experienced, what you may want to use notebooks for is to quickly review them and see which parts you may already know or may already quickly feel comfortable with. That way you don't feel slowed down by the videos. So beginners, really use the notebooks, read them well, go along with the video. Experienced users, check out the notebooks first and see if you really need the video or it allows you to maybe skip certain parts of the video and go to where you need a little more drilling down in. As far as these course notebooks that we keep mentioning, you should check your automated welcome message for the link to the notebooks. Later on, we're going to review how to actually download and open them in the running Python code lecture. These notebooks are actually a special file type, 
meaning when you download them, you're not able to just double click them and have them open. We discuss in a lot more detail throughout the course on how to actually open these notebooks that you've downloaded. The notebooks are hosted on GitHub though, so you'll be able to view them at any time, even without downloading them. The link to download them is also in our FAQ lecture. So either check your welcome message or go to the FAQ lecture for that link. Now let's talk about the student chat channel. There's also a link for our student chat channel in the automated welcome message to join our Discord server. This is a chat channel that's shared between all our courses, so you'll be able to interact with students learning about data science, finance, SQL, R, Scala, and more. In the automated welcome message, there's also a link to a YouTube video describing further information on how to use and log into our chat server. It's actually super easy, but we have that YouTube video in case there's any confusion. Something to keep in mind is that the purpose of that chat channel is to connect students with other students. Technical questions related to the course material are still best suited for our question and answer forums. So you should use that chat channel to have fun, engage with other students, but if you're having problem with a lecture or a topic or concept in the actual course, those questions are best suited for the question and answer forums. And remember, you can always search the question and answer forums for previously posted questions. All right, last but not least, a huge thank you for enrolling in this course. I'm humbled by all the students that have enrolled and I'm privileged to be your instructor for Python. Okay, let's get started and take you from zero to hero. Welcome everyone to this lecture where we're going to walk through the process step-by-step step of installing Python with the free Anaconda distribution. Now, there are many ways to actually run Python code, and we have another lecture later on called Running Python Code, where we're going to be exploring the difference between running a python.py script or running Python code in a notebook environment such as Jupyter Notebook. Either way, before we actually learn how to run that Python code, we still need to install Python locally on our computer. So, in this installation lecture, we're going to do the following. First, and the main thing about the lecture, is we'll install Anaconda distribution for Python. The Anaconda distribution is going to install the Python programming language and an easy to use development environment and navigator launch tool. That's why for this course, we choose the Anaconda distribution instead of just going to python.org and only downloading Python. The Anaconda distribution will install the language and a bunch of really useful tools, especially if you're a beginner in programming. Then we're gonna briefly run Jupyter Notebook, the development environment we use throughout the course. Keep in mind though, we'll have later lectures that dive much deeper into the details of actually programming and running Python code. This is mainly an installation lecture. After all that, we'll explore these no install online options. So a quick note on these no install options. There are actually now many online, no installation necessary Python environments that can be run directly in the browser. So as long as you have an internet connection, you actually don't need to install anything. You can just visit a website and run Python code. While these are not officially part of the course because these websites can change and sometimes go from a free plan to a paid plan, we are going to give you a brief tour of these online no install options at the very end of this installation lecture, just to give you an idea of what's out there. To begin, we're gonna install Python with the free individual Anaconda distribution. It's actually free and open source. There's nothing you need to pay for here. And as I mentioned, this distribution includes Python as well as many other useful libraries, including the Jupyter Notebook environment, which is where we do our coding in this particular course. And Anaconda can also be easily installed on any major operating system, Windows, Mac OS, or even Linux. To begin, we have to first go to the downloads website you can go to www.anaconda.com slash downloads, and it should take you to the individual product download page, or you can just do a Google search for Anaconda download, and it should take you to that page as well. I'm gonna head over to my browser and go to anaconda.com slash downloads, which should redirect me to the individual downloads page. Okay, here I am at Google, and what you can do is just search Anaconda download, hit enter, and it should take you to anaconda.com products individual. And this is the download page we're looking for, the individual edition. Or if you directly type in anaconda.com forward slash download, it should also redirect you to this page. Keep in mind, Anaconda does change the look of this page from time to time. So at a certain point in the future, it may look slightly different to you, but overall there should be some sort of download and install option on this page. The individual edition is free and open source. There's nothing you need to pay for. 
and you'll notice that eventually there's going to be a download button on this page. What you do is you can just scroll down here. It's going to talk about the various aspects that are included of Anaconda. Really, it's not just the Python programming language, although that's definitely the biggest part of it. It includes a bunch of libraries and really useful tools, especially if you're just a beginner. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to scroll down until I get to the getting started with Anaconda section and the Anaconda installers, which is really what we're looking for here, this Anaconda installers. And it's probably going to be at the bottom of the page. Also, if you just scroll all the way back up here and click download, it will automatically take you to the installer section. Now, depending on your operating system, you'll want to download the Windows installer, Mac OS installer, or the Linux installer. It's kind of up to you depending on which operating system you're actually running. Now, I am running a modern Windows 10 software, and if you're running a just relatively recently made computer, you're probably going to want to install the 64-bit graphical installer. If you're on an extremely old computer, you may want to check if you have a 32-bit graphical installer, but it's highly likely that if you're on a modern computer, you're just going to be installing the 64-bit graphical installer. If you are on Mac OS, install or download the graphical installer, not the command line installer. They're technically the same thing, but graphical installer comes with an easy to use Windows that's going to match up with exactly what we show on the Windows installer. And if you're on Linux, you can download the 64-bit installer here. Okay, since I am on a Windows computer, I'm going to click and download the 64-bit graphical installer. And once you click on that, it should begin the download. And it will also take you to a thank you for downloading web page, which you can pretty much ignore. There's a little getting started here, which is a 12 minute tutorial. You may want to take a look at that. There's also a documentation quick start guide where you can click learn more and it takes you to this user guide about Anaconda of some more details. But really what we're going to talk about is just the installation part in this lecture. In fact, if you click on that user guide, you can click on installation and it has written out step-by-step -step instructions for installing on Windows, installing on Mac OS, or installing on Linux. So depending on what operating system you have, if you really want step-by-step -step written out directions, you can go to docs.anaconda.com slash anaconda slash install, and it will take you to the documentation for a variety of setups, which we're really just gonna show here. And again, there's not too many steps here. You just click next and click all the defaults and hit I agree. Let me fast forward until this executable file is done downloading so we can walk through the installation procedure together. Once it's running, what we're going to do is set up Anaconda. So we'll click on Next here. Go ahead and agree to the license agreement. And then depending on whether or not you have admin permissions on your computer, you could do just me or all users. I'll do just me. And then I'm going to install it here under Anaconda 3. I would also suggest that you use the default destination folder. All right, and here's a very important step for Windows users. You'll notice it has this checkbox and it says that it's not recommended to check it. If this is your first installation of Python and you intend to use this distribution of Anaconda as your main source for actually running Python code, then I would actually recommend that you install it and add it to your path environment variable. Basically what this means is that if you were to open up the Windows command prompt and type Python, it would come first and search for the Anaconda version of Python before looking at any other pre-installed Python. And if you're following along this course and you intend to use this as your main distribution, then we actually do recommend adding Anaconda 3 to my path environment variable. If later on and you decided not to check this box and want to add it to your path, what you can do is open up Anaconda 3 with the Windows Start menu and then select Anaconda 64-bit and then this Add to Path option will essentially be the same thing as clicking this box here. For simple use cases, I actually do recommend that you click this box. So I will go ahead and click that box and just add it to my path environment variable since I want Anaconda 3 to be found first. So then we'll hit install. And my Anaconda installation is now complete. So I will go ahead and click next. And you'll notice it says, working with Python and Jupyter Notebooks is a breeze with PyCharm Professional, etc." We don't actually need to worry about installing PyCharm. It's just another development environment option for you. There's pretty much a wider range of environments you can choose from. We'll be using the Anaconda and Jupyter environment just because we feel that is the most accessible to someone learning Python for the first time. And it's free and open source. So we'll go ahead and skip this little kind of advertisement there. And then what we're going to do is we're also just going to 
skip the tutorial, and then skip learning more about Anaconda. Those were actually the first two links that we showed you earlier. And then hit finish, and you should be good to go. Okay, now that we've finished installing Anaconda, let's show you the two ways to run it. One is through the Anaconda Navigator. To do this, search your computer for Anaconda Navigator. So I'm going to search for Anaconda Navigator. So I'm going to open up the Anaconda Navigator app. And you may need to run this as an administrator on some computers, specifically on some work computers. But go ahead and open up and click on Anaconda Navigator in order to run the application. Upon clicking that, you should see it beginning to initialize. And sometimes this takes a while, especially on the first time you're running Anaconda Navigator. So be patient while it loads. But eventually, you should see this graphical interface pop up for Anaconda Navigator. OK, here we are at Anaconda Navigator. It'll ask you whether or not you want to send reports to Anaconda. Feel free to send the reports or not send the reports. I'm just going to hit OK here. And right now, it's loading a little bit more content. And there we go. So now we have Anaconda Navigator, which is essentially a graphical interface for the various development environments that Anaconda comes with. You'll notice that it has Jupyter Lab, Jupyter Notebook, a PowerShell prompt for you, as well as Qt Console, Spider, GlueViz, Orange 3, and even RStudio. So Anaconda is essentially packaged, not just Python, but a bunch of development environments for you. For the course, in general, we are using Jupyter Notebook. Not Jupyter Lab, although it's extremely similar, but Jupyter Notebook. Just something to keep in mind. All right, now before we actually launch Jupyter Notebook, what I want to do is finish this tour of Anaconda Navigator. On the left-hand side, you see the Home tab. There is also the Environments tab. Environments, in this case, actually stands for Virtual Environments, which you may be familiar if you've programmed before. It essentially allows you to create a little virtual environment separate from your base environment to install particular versions of libraries. We'll talk about this later on in the course. You can see that I have some environments already. You should probably just have your base root environment and maybe one more, like a new environment. But for right now, you can go ahead and ignore and skip this tab. And finally, there's the learning community tabs. Learning is just a bunch of links to documentation and some training videos you can check out. It's really leaning really heavily towards data science and machine learning because Anaconda is really popular with that community. And speaking of community, you can click on the community tab and it's a bunch of links to events and forums you can check out. Again, highly skewed towards uh, data science and machine learning. Let's come back home. And once you're home, what you're going to do is hit the launch button underneath Jupyter Notebook. We won't be working with Jupyter Lab for now. It's really similar, but for right now, Jupyter Notebook is a simpler of the two. It's easier to get started with Jupyter Notebook. So click on launch on Jupyter Notebook. It's going to load for a little bit, but then it's going to redirect you to a Jupyter Notebook in your browser. And don't be alarmed if you notice it automatically opens your default browser. We highly recommend Chrome as your default browser when working with Jupyter Notebook. So you can check that out, but it should automatically open the default browser on your computer. So for example, you can see off screen, it actually did this for me. It went ahead and opened up Jupyter. So Jupyter does not require the internet to run. It's just using your browser as a visual interface for you to write code in. And you notice that it's typically going to launch in your C drive or in your main user drive, depending if you're using Windows or Mac OS. In which case, you should see a directory of all your folders and files. So notice in my C drive, I can see my desktop folders, documents, downloads, etc. So then if I click on one of these, like desktop, it actually shows me everything I have underneath my desktop folders and different files there. I can come back up, and this is essentially allowing me to explore files and folders across my computer, whether they're in documents, downloads, favorites, games, music, etc. What I can also do is create new folders and new notebook files from here as well. Let's quickly explore that. I can click on New, and you'll see the option for a new notebook and the option to create a new folder, as well as a terminal connection and text file. We'll ignore those for now. We can click on New Folder, and if you click on New Folder, it should create a new untitled folder, essentially at the bottom of this list of folders. So if you scroll down here, eventually you should see something that says like Untitled Folder created just a few seconds ago. And then if you open it, it's completely empty. So this would allow you to actually create notebooks inside. So it says the notebook list is empty because this is just an empty folder. What I can do then is I could come back up a directory, scroll down and rename this folder. I can click the checkbox here, untitled folder, 
and if you scroll up it'll say do you want to rename it so let's go ahead and rename it let's call it my Python stuff hit rename and now let's open it up again so it says my Python stuff I'm gonna open up my Python stuff it says the notebook list is empty let's create our first notebook notebook is what we're actually going to be writing code in I will select new it says notebook hit Python 3 and so automatically launch and connect to a new notebook we're gonna be discovering notebooks in a lot more detail later on in the course when we talk about running Python code but just as a really quick tour of what a Jupyter notebook is it's essentially an environment where there's individual cells where you can write Python code let's run our very first piece of Python code just using Python as a calculator I will say 1 plus 1 and then what I can do is I can run the cell I could say cell run cells and it will run the cell with the input as 1 plus 1 and the output as 2 I can also type in or actually do shift enter I'm not just typing it in this is just to show you what I'm about to do if I hit shift enter on my keyboard it will run this cell and then create a new cell underneath it so I'm gonna do shift enter on my keyboard again it runs the cell and creates a new cell underneath it this is the main way we're gonna be learning how to program throughout the course keep in mind we do show you how to run .py scripts using something like a text editor like sublime text to give you the option of running Python code however you prefer but for the majority of the course we use notebooks because it allows us to write notes and just organize our data and learn better using Python and all the course notes are organized in notebooks in fact if you go back to the very first lecture of the course or check your automated welcome message as well as the Q&A forums you'll see that we have this Perian data link with the complete three or complete Python 3 bootcamp with all the sections and notebooks that correspond to those sections so I can click on something for instance like the milestone project one click on warm-up project exercises and these are notebooks hosted on github for you and later on we'll actually show you how to download these notebooks but you can see that the notebooks allow you to post images post explanatory text and code all in one single interface this is why they're so useful for learning Python for the very first time and we're gonna talk a lot more about using Jupyter and running code later on but for right now you should have been able to create your first notebook run some code and keep in mind there's a whole help tab here for a user interface tour this user interface tour super helpful if you just click on it it actually takes you through a kind of left and right uh, code tour on file names and stuff you can do within the notebook so I highly recommend you actually just click help and take that user interface tour now before heading on to the next lecture once we're done with this notebook we can simply close this tab notice the notebook is actually still running noted by the green little icon you can simply check the box and shut down the notebook if you shut down the notebook the code and text is all saved there but it's not deleted if you do want to delete this notebook completely from your computer's memory check the box and then hit this little trash con or trash icon and then it's gonna say hey do you want to permanently delete this notebook go ahead and hit delete and now it's permanently removed same thing for the folder if you go back up a directory and for some reason you will now want to delete this my Python stuff folder simply check this box scroll back up here and hit the trash can icon it's gonna ask you do you want to permanently delete this folder keep in mind Jupyter only allows you to delete folders that are completely empty this is a safety concern that way you don't accidentally delete a whole folder permanently go ahead and click delete here and you should have been able to delete that folder all right so in this lecture we were already able to install Anaconda launch Anaconda Navigator and launch our very first Jupyter Notebook coming up next we're going to discuss how to run Python code both as a .py script and within the Jupyter Notebook to end this lecture I did mention there were some no installation options we're going to do a very brief tour of this if you're interested if not go ahead and move on to the next lecture let's give you a brief tour of all the no install options available on the internet at this time all right so let's quickly check out some no installation options the ones we're going to cover just briefly here are the official try option from jupyter.org slash try that will actually allow you to run a Jupyter notebook with nothing to install directly in your browser then we'll also check out Google Collab online notebooks you do need a Google account like a Gmail address in order to access those but it's a pretty cool feature provided by Google and then we'll also check out uh, repel it or repl.it 
And that's a website that allows you just to write some Python code, have it interpreted and run. I should mention there are dozens of these sort of websites and you can find them by just doing a quick Google search for Python interpreter online and you'll get a ton of options, including the ones shown here. But for a very brief note, why would you not want to just use one of these options instead of installing something locally? For one thing, it can be hard to upload your own code, data, or notebooks on one of these free no installation options. And also, sometimes they have the free tier that doesn't save your code, and then you have to actually pay in order to have your code save and run on their service. So keep that in mind. And then the third thing is, we're not officially supporting any of these no installation options as part of this course, since they could change in the future. All right, I'm gonna head over to my browser and just give you a brief tour of these options. Okay, the first option is jupiter.org slash try. It's essentially the exact same thing I just showed you locally, but hosted here for free on the cloud. So you can try the classic Python notebook. You can also try it with things like R and Jupyter Lab to try it out. You click on try classic notebook and it's gonna upload just a temporary instance of a Jupyter notebook. I actually often use these when I don't want to run Jupyter Notebook locally, and I do want to run just a quick piece of Python code and have this run a temporary cloud-hosted Jupyter Notebook. Nothing you put here is actually going to get saved, so keep that in mind, it's just a temporary notebook being hosted in the cloud. All right, so once that's fully loaded, it's gonna look something like this. This is essentially a Jupyter Notebook. It's gonna tell you your memory limits. Keep in mind, locally, you obviously don't have memory limits like this. It's just the memory limit of your computer's RAM or hard drive space. You can just insert a new cell or say, uh, insert cell below. Here's the new cell. Type in something like one plus one or print one plus run, and then run these cells, and you'll get to see the output. And this is jupyter.org slash try really nice to just quickly run a notebook hosted online. And nothing here is actually going to get saved permanently. You can click save and it will save your changes, but you can't come back to this website and expect your notebook to be here. Another option for downloading it here is if I zoom out just a little bit, you can click here on file, download as, you can download this as a notebook, markdown, LaTeX, HTML, tons of options here. There's even uh, JavaScript slides, reveal.js if you're familiar with that but that allows you to download it locally in case you really wanted to save any changes there. Okay, I'm gonna close out of this option. Next option is Google Collab Notebooks. This is a free notebook service from Google, really focused on machine learning and data science, and you do need a Gmail account to access this. Go ahead and just Google search Google Collab Notebooks and then go to collab.research.google.com and you can click on one of these already pre-made notebooks or you can click on new notebook and it takes you to this new Google Collab Notebook. And here, what's really cool, if you have a Gmail account, it will actually save your notebook and you can do things like load up data to a Google Drive. The downside is it's not exactly a Jupyter Notebook. It's kind of a specialized Google version of it, but you can say something like one plus one here, click run or hit shift enter, and it's going to run that code and then output the results. And actually right now it's connecting and initializing. Now that it's connected, you can see it ran to here, one plus one. You are limited on your RAM and disk space, but there's a paid tier in case you decide to do really huge machine learning or deep learning data sets later on in your Python career. This could be an option for you. Now I'm gonna close this one. Last one I wanna show you is this Repellit. It's a browser-based IDE. It is collaborative and do have a free tier you can check out. So if you click on start coding, you do have to make an account, log in and sign up. And if you check out the pricing on this, there is a starter edition that's totally free. So if you want, you can use this. It doesn't give you a whole lot of CPU power though compared to something locally. So keep that in mind. And really it's kind of meant for collaborative coding environments. And if you go back here to the Google search of Repellit, you'll notice there's a little Python link here and you can click here, go to Repellit slash languages slash Python three. And you should be able to actually just kind of give it a little test run. So I can do something like print one plus one, hit run here, and it's gonna give me the output two. Again, there's limits here. Nothing's gonna get saved unless you make an account log in. For the best experience with this course, I do recommend that you work with a local installation. It's much easier to follow along that way, but I do wanna give you some options in case you're on a computer where for some reason you don't have full admin permissions to install anything. Okay, with that being said, let's move on to the next lecture and really dive into running Python code. I'll see you there.
Welcome back everyone. It's now time to test your new skill set with web scraping with some exercises. In this lecture, we're just going to give a brief overview of the exercise questions and what they're asking for. And then in the next series of lectures, we'll go ahead and work through some example solutions. Let's get started. Okay, so here I am under the web scraping exercise notebook. It's called the web scraping exercise. And essentially we just have a list of tasks for you to complete. So first thing to do is import any libraries you think you'll need. And then the second thing is to use the request library and beautiful soup to connect to quotes.toscrape.com to get the HTML text from the homepage. So if you click on that link, it'll take you to this quotes to scrape. It was essentially the other to scrape site. So we looked at books scraping that site in the previous uh, lectures. And now we can see that we have some quotes to scrape. So essentially this site, a couple things to note here, there's quotes to scrape, there's a quote, the person who said the quote, and then tags for each quote, such as change, deep thoughts, etc. And then there's the top 10 tags over here on the right hand side across the entire site. So you can scroll down here and see that you can click next. And that brings you to the next list of quotes by some authors. And you can also click on about, and that takes you to an about description for those authors. If you click quotes to scrape, that takes you back to the home page. And if you click on one of these tags, such as inspirational, it shows you any quote with the tags inspirational. And then you can always hit next to keep going for whatever pages of those tags for inspirational are. Coming back to the exercise, uh, this is what it should look like. Essentially, we just want you to grab that text. This is just from the home page, that first page. Then we want you to get the names of all the authors on the first page. So a quick little hint here, notice that I'm using a set, not a list. Next is to create a list. This is specifically a Python list of all the quotes on the first page. So we want you to create a list that looks something like this. Next, we want you to inspect the site and then use Beautiful Soup to extract the top 10 tags from the request text. So essentially what we want you to do is if you notice on the homepage, we have these top 10 tags. We want you to use Python to figure out how to grab what these 10 words are. So eventually you should get something that it can either be a list or a string or just print it out, but we want those actual tags. After that, we have the final task and this final task is kind of a larger one, but basically you'll notice that there's more than one page and the subsequent pages look something like this. Let me zoom in so you can read this as well. They have quotes to scrape.com slash and then page slash the page number. So we want you to use what you already know about for loops, string concatenation, and everything you've learned through the course to go ahead and loop through all the pages. And we want you to get the unique authors, but now on the entire website. The first question was to get the unique authors on the homepage, but now create a set of the unique authors on the entire website. Now keep in mind, there's lots of ways to achieve this, but what we want you to do is try to make your code robust enough that it would work regardless of knowing how many pages there were beforehand. Now, as a hint, we want you to know that there's actually only 10 pages on this website. So if you come to quotes to scrape forward slash 10, and then try to hit next, there's no next button there. And then if you try to go to a page that's larger than that, such as slash 100, you'll notice it'll say no quotes found. So that's kind of a big hint on how you can try to solve that problem. So if you want, you can just use a for loop that goes from page one to 10, but really try to challenge yourself because in a typical situation, you won't know how many pages of quotes there are. So see if you can figure out how to make your code robust enough in order for it to work, regardless if you knew how many pages there were. Last thing to keep in mind is there's many, many different types of solutions for a lot of these things. So don't feel uh, that you need to check if your code is viable if you figured it out differently than the solutions notebook. As long as you get the same results, then you should be good to go. So lots of different ways to solve all these problems. All right, best of luck. We'll see you at the solutions lecture. Welcome back everyone. In this lecture, we're going to discuss for loops. Now many objects in Python are iterable meaning that we can iterate over every element in the object, such as every element in a list or every character in a string. And we can use for loops to execute a block of code for every iteration. So I wanna focus a little bit on this term iterable because you hear it a lot, especially in Python documentation, and it's kind of a strange term if you've never heard it before. So all this term means is that you can iterate over the object, and that means you can perform an action for every thing in that object. So for example, for every character in a string, 
you can iterate through that string and then do something for every character. Often maybe you want to print out every single letter in that string or every single character in that string. So that means the string is an iterable object. You can work through it. You can also iterate over every item in a list. That means the list is iterable. And then you can iterate over every key in a dictionary. So the dictionary itself can also be iterated over. So kind of a little funny term there, but just think of it as a way of going through something. So let's go over the example of the syntax of a for loop. So this is the syntax of a for loop right here. Notice that we have a list defined, and then we have a couple of keywords, and then we're performing some actions. So let's focus on each aspect of this syntax. We start off with this statement, and this is just an assignment. We're saying my iterable, we're choosing that as a variable name. This could be my list, uh, my items, my dogs, whatever you want, is equal to, and in this case, we're choosing a list. We're going to see other examples of other iterables in just a second. So we make some sort of assignments. We have a variable name there. And then we're going to say for, so that keyword for item name. So this is a variable name that you can choose that's going to be a bit of a placeholder for every single item in your iterable object. So in this case, the item name actually represents the numbers in that list. Then we say in, so another keyword there, and then the variable name that you chose, in this case, my iterable. So we're saying for every item or item name in this list of one, two, three, then we have a colon, and then we have some white space, and then we perform or execute some block of code. In this case, we're saying print item name. But you didn't have to actually use the item name. You could have just printed hello three times. So we're going to show more examples of that. But that's the basis syntax for a for loop. So let's actually explore these concepts in a Jupyter notebook and try to build a deeper understanding. So we're going to perform for loops for a bunch of different objects in Python. And I think by the end of this lecture, you're going to have a fair understanding of the basic idea of for loop and how to work with them. And this is really where you begin to level up your skills. So before, we've basically just been learning about data types, objects. We haven't really been able to construct anything yet. Once you start learning about control flow and for loops and later on while loops and then after that functions, etc., this is where we really start to be able to construct logical programs. Okay, so it's an exciting leap. Let's head to the Jupyter Notebook and get started. All right, let's begin with a simple example. I'm going to create a list called my list, and we're going to set this equal through the numbers one through 10. We'll say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then finally 10. And as a very quick note, you should not use list as a variable name here. Notice that it's being highlighted through syntax highlighting. That means list is a built-in keyword, so avoid using just list by itself as a variable name. If for some reason you accidentally already did that, go ahead and delete this, and then just hit kernel, restart, and then restart this, and that will reset all your variable names. What you will need to do is then rerun some cells if you already have stuff defined. So I just need to rerun that. Notice how now it's back at one, so I've restarted everything. Okay, so I have this list, one through 10. Now I'm going to create a for loop to iterate for every item in this list. So I start with the keyword for, and then I get to choose a variable name that's going to represent the elements inside of this list. So we're going to say for num in my list, that iterable, colon, I hit enter, and notice now how I have an indented block of code there. So now I can interact with those actual elements. So let's print them out. I'm going to say for num in my list, print num. And then when I run this, I see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So it's actually printing out this number for every number in that list. Something I want to make really clear, though, is that this particular variable name that you chose to represent the elements inside that list, it can be whatever you want. So here I chose num because these are numbers, but I'm going to just make it really obvious by choosing jelly and then saying for jelly in my list, print jelly. Run that again, and you get back the exact same results. So again, this variable name can be whatever you want. This iterable can't be, it has to be predefined, but this variable name that's going to represent the actual objects inside that iterable, that is whatever you want. Now I also want to show you the point that we technically don't even need to use this variable name. We can still execute some block of code for every single item in this list, even if the code itself is unrelated to the item. So I can print hello, for every item in that list, and we get back hello one through 10 times. And again, we can call this whatever we want, num, run that, and we get back hello 10 times. So keep in mind, when choosing these variable names, you have full flexibility, so you'll want to choose a variable name that is somehow related to the object inside that iterable. 
Now let's combine our knowledge of for loops with a little bit of what we just discussed in control flow. Let's see if we can print out only the even numbers in this list. So to do that, what we're going to do is start off by saying for num in my list. And then I'm going to add in some control flow to somehow check if the number is even. So I'll say check for even here. This is just a comment. And then what I will do is the following. I'll say if num mod two is equal to zero, colon, print the number. So what I'm doing here is I'm saying, okay, for every number in that list, if the num mod two, so remember that's the remainder when you divide by two is equal to zero. So if there's an even number and you divide it by two and the remainder is zero, then you can go ahead and print that number. So then when we run this, here we have all the even numbers, two, four, six, eight, ten. And I can add even more control flow by attaching an else statement to this if statement and then say print odd number. And we can even do some f string literal formatting so I can say if odd number right there, run that, and it says odd number one, two, odd number three, four, odd number five, six. So this is some good work here as far as combining for loops with the control flow from before. Key things to note here is the indentation. So luckily Python is very clean because of the use case of indentation. So everything at this indentation level is inside of this for loop. So this entire block of code is going to execute for every single number in that list. And then we can see that this print num is only going to execute when this if statement is true. And this else indentation is lined up with this if. So we say if, this case, print num, else, and then we print out the odd number. And again, using some f string literal here to nicely print out that number itself. All right, let's move along. So another common idea for a for loop is to keep some sort of running tally during multiple loops. And later on, we're going to show you the enumerate function, which kind of does this for you automatically. But for right now, what I'm going to do is say list sum is equal to zero. So let's try to get the sum of every number in that list. So I will say for num in my list, I will say the list sum is equal to the current list sum plus the number. And then I'm going to, outside of this for loop, print out the list sum. So when I run this, I get back 55. So this is a good example of indentation and a use case. So right now I have this list sum. So I'm saying my initial sum is zero. Then for every single number in that list, I take my old value for my sum and I add on the current number and then I reassign that value to list sum. So I do that over and over again for every number in that list. And then at the end of this for loop, when it's, once it's done completing, so notice the indentation level here, I print out list sum. Let's see what would happen if I were to press tab here and have this print statement inside of this for loop. Now when I run this, I get back kind of the running tally of this sum. So it starts off at zero, and then once it has this first run inside of the for loop, it gets printed out. So then it has zero plus one. Well, that's equal to one, so it prints out one. Then we have one plus two. Well, that's three, then it prints out three. Three plus three is six, six plus four is 10, 10 plus five is 15, and so on. So now we get the running tally. And it's only until the very end that we see 55. If we only wanna see the last result, then I just have this print outside of that for loop. So that's why indentation in white space is so important. So we just saw how to use for loops with lists, but what about strings? Remember strings are a sequence, so that means we can iterate through them and we'll be accessing each character in that string. So we'll say for letter in, and let's create a string. We'll say my string is equal to hello world. Then for letter in my string colon, print out that letter. And I run this here, I can see H-E-L-L-O space W-O-R-L-D. So that's the way we can actually iterate through a string itself. And technically, you don't need to actually assign a variable name to the string. What you could do is just straight up put the string here. So we could say for letter in hello world, print letter. And we get back the exact same results. And I really wanna drive this point home. You can call this whatever you want. So this letter variable name, you can say GHGH, and as long as it's the same thing inside of this, 
and you run this, you'll get back the same result. And the other thing I wanna stress is that you technically don't even need to use this variable. So a lot of times what people do as they get more advanced in Python, for some reason they wanna iterate something a certain amount of times. So imagine I wanted to print cool for as many times as there are characters here. So I see cool, 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 cool. What they do is instead of assigning this variable name, they just use an underscore. And that's really common syntax for when you don't intend to actually use that variable name as you iterate through. So they just use a simple underscore there. That way it's a little more readable. Okay, so that's iterating through a for loop. You can also use the same iteration for a tuple. So I can say tuple is equal to one, two, three. Then for item and tuple, print out the item, run that, and I get back one, two, three. Now, I wanna mention tuple and packing. So tuples have a little bit of a special quality when it comes to for loops. So if you're iterating through a sequence that contains itself tuples, the item can be used with tuple unpacking. So let me show you what I mean by this. I'm going to create a new list called my list, and I'm going to set this equal to a list of tuples. So here I have square brackets, and I'm going to make some tuple pairs. We'll say one, two, comma, then three, four, comma, five, six, comma, seven, eight. So notice what I have here. I have a list and then there's tuple pairs as items in that list. So if I check out the length of my list, I have four items in it where every single item is a tuple pair. So let's print out those items themselves. So for item in my list, print out the item. And when I run this, I actually see the tuples themselves. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This sort of data structure is extremely common in Python. And later on, we're going to see that a lot of built-in Python functions actually take advantage of this built-in structure and return back tuples inside of a list. And the reason for that is something called tuple unpacking. Right now, we had to print out every single item inside this tuple. But what I could do is the following. I could say, let me delete this print statement. I could do the following. I could say for and make kind of a temporary variable name that looks like a tuple here. So for a, b in my list, then I can print the variable a and then print the variable b. So note what happens now. I'm saying one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So what's actually going on here? Well, this is called tuple and packing where you kind of duplicate the structure of the items, in this case, tuples inside of this sequence and then unpack them. So now I have access to the individual items. So if I only wanna print out the first item in those tuples, so I run this, I get back one, three, five, seven, because now I'm only printing A. So this is known as tuple and packing. And technically you actually don't need these parentheses here. So it's a lot more common to see it done this way with no parentheses. So now I say for A, B in my list, print A. Let's see what happens if we print B, we should get back all those even numbers. So that second half, that two, four, six, eight. So again, this is tuple and packing. And you're going to be using it a lot as you start working with more built-in Python functions because a lot of things will return kind of pairs and sequences in this manner where you have a list of tuples. And I wanna show you one more example. Let's say my list is equal to a list one, two, three. One, two, three. Well, let's make it some different numbers. Say five, six, seven, and we'll do one more with eight, nine, and 10. I skipped the number four here, but no big deal. We'll say four item in my list, print item, and there are my three tuples, but I can do tuple unpacking here. So the way I can do that is make up three variable names, separate them by commas. So I can say A, B, C. Notice I don't have to use parentheses, and then I can print out whichever one of these I want. For example, if I just want to print out two, six, and nine, those middle numbers, I would just say B, and there we go, we have access to B, so just the middle number. So this is really useful when you maybe wanted to reorganize the, these structures into some other manner, or maybe you only want to deal with the first item in these tuple pairs. Okay, so that's tuple and packing, and now let's finish off this discussion about for loops by discussing how to iterate through a dictionary. So to do that, we're going to create a dictionary called D. It's gonna have K1 as a key value, and we'll have the number one as that value. 
we'll say k2 here, colon 2, and then we'll say k3, colon 3, and then I'm going to, for item in D, print the item. So this is something that's kind of interesting. Notice that by default, when you iterate through a dictionary, you only iterate through the keys. So K1, K2, and K3. If you actually want to iterate through the items themselves, what you need to do is call dot items here. And now when you run that, you get back these tuple pairs, K1 with one, K2 with two, K3 with three, which means we can use the same tuple unpacking technique we just discussed. So instead of item, what I can do is say key, comma value, and let's say I only wanted to print out the values. Then I could say for key value in d.items, print out the value, and now I have one, two, and three. Again, taking advantage of tuple unpacking here because d.items returns back something in this sort of format. And more likely it's this sort of format. We have a key and a value. So we're using the same tuple unpacking that we just discussed now with d.items. So by default, when you iterate through a dictionary, it's going to be the keys. If you want to iterate through the items, you can use tuple unpacking to grab both keys and values. If you only want the values themselves, what you could do is say d dot, and then call values off of this, run that, and it'll only print out the values one, two, three. The last thing I want to note here is that dictionaries are technically unordered. This is a very small dictionary, so it looks like it's, everything's going in order, one, two, three, K1, K2, K3. But if you have a very large dictionary, there's no guarantee that things are going to be sorted or in any sort of order. So keep that in mind. When you iterate through a dictionary, there's no guarantee that you're gonna get things back in the order you put them in. Okay, so now we've learned about how to use for loops with tuples, lists, strings, and dictionaries. This is going to be a really important tool for us, so make sure you understood it well with the above examples. Specifically, make sure you really understand the white space. So probably the most important thing to get out of this lecture is the fact that you use this for keyword, any temporary variable you want, you say then the keyword in, some sort of iterable object, either values, the list, or a string itself, as we saw up here, colon, and then in this indented block of code, that's going to execute every single time for every single iterable in that list. Thanks everyone, and if you have any questions, feel free to post them to the Q&A forums. I'll see you at the next lecture. Hey everyone, welcome back to this lecture on numbers in Python. We already briefly mentioned that there's two main number types that we're going to be working with throughout the course, and that is integers, which are whole numbers, and floating point numbers, which are numbers of a decimal. We're going to be exploring a little bit of basic math with Python, and then we'll also discuss how to create variables and assign them values. Let's open up a Jupyter Notebook and get started. All right, so before we actually start typing any code, I wanted to briefly mention that if you ever want to toggle this toolbar or this header on or off, you can just come here, click View, and then select Toggle Header or Toggle Toolbar to turn them on or off. And typically, during the lectures, I'll have them off, so we have as much space for coding as possible. Let's start off by just going over some basic math, which is pretty straightforward, and it's basically just using Python as a calculator. If you want to do addition, it's just an addition sign or a plus sign, two plus one. If you want to do subtraction, that's just a dash or a minus sign, two minus one. You can use an asterisk for multiplication, so two times two. And if you want to perform division, that's just a forward slash. So three divided by two is 1.5. Okay, now let's take a little bit of time to discuss a mathematical operation that you may not have seen before. It's the modulo or mod operator. And basically what this does, it returns back the remainder after a division. For example, if we were to do seven divided by four, we get back 1.75. And if you were to do this, kind of using a elementary school mathematics, you would say seven divided by four, four goes into seven one time with a remainder of three because four plus three is seven. Let's imagine you actually just wanted to know that remainder, the actual number three. In that case, you can use the mod operator, which is a percent sign. So we're going to say seven mod four, and it returns back three because seven divided by four, it goes in one time evenly with a remainder of three. So for example, we could do 50, mod five, and if five goes into 50 evenly, then we get back a remainder of zero, which is nice because it's a way to check if a number is evenly divisible by another number. That's a really convenient check when you want to check if a number is even or not. So let's imagine we have an odd number, 23, 
and we want to know if it's even or odd. Well, I could just look at it, but maybe some time in my code, it's disguised as a variable, and I really need to quickly check if it's even or odd. One way I could do this is simply with a mod2. And I know that if mod2 results in something other than zero, then we have an odd number. Because if I have an even number, then when you divide it by two, there should be no remainder, or the remainder should be zero. So that's the mod operator. Again, it just gives you back the remainder after you perform a division. Let's continue with everything else about arithmetic. You can also perform powers. So you can do something like two to the power of three. So that's just two asterisk signs in a row. So to the power of three, that's eight. And then we can also perform order of operations. Let's imagine that I have the following equation. Two plus 10 multiplied by 10 plus three. If I run that code, I get back 105. But what if I wanted to actually have two plus 10 occur first, then multiply that by the result of 10 plus three. Right now we're following basic order of operations with math, which is going to perform this multiplication first before it does this addition. So it's performing 10 times 10, 100 plus two plus three. So to have our operations happen first, the way we want them, we can use parentheses. I can say two plus 10 multiplied by, and in parentheses, 10 plus three. And if I run that, I get back 156 the way I want it. Okay, so that's the basics of arithmetic and using Python as a calculator. Hopefully it was pretty straightforward. Coming up next, we're going to expand on this by showing you how you can perform variable assignments. That is to create your own variable name and then assign an object to it. We'll see you there at the next lecture.